Good morning and welcome to this worship service of the Gathering Church. It's wonderful to see some faces logging on and joining in, connecting to audio and video. It's good to see, I see Leandra, Laura and Tom. I see some Hoots kiddos and Hoots adults as well. Uh, it's good to see familiar faces. We're glad uh, that you are joining us in worship today on this, uh, what is the second Sunday of Lent. And if you didn't grow up in a church environment where you celebrate Lent or observe the church calendar, that's okay. Uh, Lent is a season of preparation for Easter. So it's the 40 days, not counting the Sundays, as we lead up to uh, Easter Sunday. And so uh, we're kind of observing that as we move through this season to prepare our hearts, our minds, because Easter is so expansive and big that it can't be limited to just one day. Uh, we're grateful that you're joining us then on this Sunday morning here uh, virtually and digitally through Zoom on the Zoom of verse here at the Gathering Church. Uh, if you are new with us, welcome. We want to say thank you for joining us. Uh, you'll see that you are muted, and part of that is so that we can uh, all hear whoever's speaking, singing, leading at any, any given point in the service, and so that's so that we can all participate well. We'd encourage you right now um, to try out the different views on Zoom. If you're not used to that, you can do either speaker view, which is great for when someone's leading, like when Lee's going to be singing or others um, are speaking so that you can see and participate in that way. But you also want to use the gallery view at different points because it's great to log on and see who's joining in worship this morning. Part of the, the gift and the beauty of, of Zoom is that we get to see faces of real live human beings, even though they're... Uh, two-dimensional. We know that they exist in the real world, that we're not worshiping uh, just alone, that we've gathered here at this time to worship together. Also, um, if you have a couple things around your house, it'd be great to have them with you this morning. Um, if you have a candle, fantastic. We like to light a candle at the beginning of every worship service, and so you can get that. If not, you can use a flashlight, a lighter, uh, matches, or if you don't have anything, that's okay too. We'll light one for you so that you can see it on, on your screen. And then also, if you have um, a form of bread, crackers, uh, whatever you can find, and then a cup of wine, or juice, or water even, because we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper uh, communion together as we share in that meal. Um, also, good to know as we are moving through this, uh, Charles Cleaver will be sharing his screen with you at various points so that you can participate in worship. And you can see Charles doing that right now. He's doing that so that you'll be able to see uh, lyrics to our songs and uh, passages of scripture to read along. And there'll be parts where you can uh, join in and sort of um, in worship by saying things out loud. Um, and then also um, one quick sort of just announcement here at the beginning is if you want to join our weekly email, I'll put the link in the chat box right now. So you can follow that link and sign up. That's sort of the best way to stay connected with what's happening in the life of the Gathering Church right now. So we hope that you'll uh, be aware and participate in the ways that you can during this season. My name is Kurt Lowndes. I'm the pastor here at the Gathering Church, one of the pastors here at the Gathering Church. You'll hear from others throughout the service who are going to be leading us and serving us in worship this morning. We think that uh, worship is the work of the people. That's the word for liturgy. It means the work of the people. And so we think you're involved in this today, and we hope you'll join us in that um, Part of worship is how we bring all of who we are to God and we share in this act of worship together. And so we need you just as much as you need us for worship this morning. At the Gathering Church, we believe that God has called us uh, to love our neighbors incredibly well as Jesus did, that we've received from this great love. And so we seek to share and to spread the good news of God's love each and every day in our lives. And so we hope that you'll join us in doing that today. If you have a candle with you at this time, I'd invite you to join me in lighting that candle. We do this each week to remind ourselves and one another 
that Jesus Christ is the light of the world and that God's presence is here with us in worship. And also to be reminded that God has called us light, that we are the light of the world, that we share and reflect God's light because we're made in God's image and we shine through that love that God has so freely given and shared with us. And we also like to begin our service by taking a moment to pause, to do our best to be still and to focus all of who we are. We need our bodies, our hearts, and our minds for worship. And so we'd encourage you to take a deep breath and to join us in doing that now. We do this to remind ourselves that the spirit of the living God is within us, that we've been given this gift of life. We've been called and claimed by God and we open with prayer. So join me this morning in prayer, friends. Jesus, you welcome us into your kingdom as honored guests each and every one of us. You welcome us with open arms and you show us abundant hospitality. Merciful God, you welcome us even though we are sinners. We confess that we haven't loved you with all we are, with everything that we have. And we confess that we've failed to walk in your ways and to love your neighbors as ourselves. But we trust in your forgiveness we know that you forgive our debts and you give us a seat at your table. So Lord, we've gathered here this morning to give you our worship, our praise, our lives, to hear from you today. So set our hearts on fire with a love and devotion that only you can give that's sparked to life by your gracious love. We thank you that you have invited us to be here with you, that you see us not as we see ourselves or as others see us, but you see us as beloved. God, we pray all this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Let's sing together, Holy, Holy, Holy. Thy work shall praise thy name in earth and sky. 
sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Thank you, Lee. Well, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, at this time, we are going to read and pray through a section of the Divine Hours, which is a collection of scripture passages and prayers. And there'll be some portions that are underlined that we'd encourage you to say out loud to join us in reading them. Uh, even though you're muted and you might be in a room by yourself, that's okay. God has gathered us and drawn us together in this way. And so Sarah Brunson is going to lead us this morning as we pray and read together. The call to prayer. Sing to the Lord, you servants of his. Give thanks for the remembrance of his holiness. For his wrath endures but the twinkling of an eye, his favor for a lifetime. The request for presence. I cry out to you, O Lord, I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. The greeting. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you. We give you thanks. We praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Refrain on this day, the Lord has acted. We will rejoice and be glad in it. The Morning Psalm. Let this be written for a future generation, so that a people yet unborn may praise the Lord. For the Lord looked down from his holy place on high, from the heavens he beheld the earth, that he might hear the groan of the captive and set free those condemned to die that they may declare in Zion the name of the Lord and his praise in Jerusalem, when the peoples are gathered together and the kingdoms also to serve the Lord. The refrain, on this day, the Lord has acted. We will rejoice and be glad in it. The prayer appointed for the week. Most loving Father, whose will it is for us to give thanks for all things, to fear nothing but the loss of you, and to cast all our care on you who cares for us. Preserve us from faithless fears and worldly anxieties, that no clouds of this mortal life may hide from us the light of that love which is immortal, and which you have manifested to us in your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now join me in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sarah. This time we're going to hear from Jessica Nyman, who leads our children and our youth in uh, discovering their relationship with God and living out their faith uh, here on earth. So Jessica, what do you have for us this morning? Hey, good morning. It's so good to see you all. And I see a lot of these beautiful kids 
kids' faces this morning. It's so good to see you all. I see Olive. She's front and center with her own headphones on. Uh, Owen and James. Hey, guys. Good to see you. Oh, and I see Ola, or Olivia and Alex and Ethan. Wow, it's so good to see you all. And I see Emerson. I see you. I see that hand. Sorry, I had to. It was it was so it could I couldn't help it. Anyway, um, so it's so good to see you all. And we're gonna sing a song this morning, and James is gonna lead us. And James, if you don't know James, kids, James has led our Christmas um program for years, and he's just the coolest, and he's an amazing musician. He's gonna lead us in a song. And the song is one of my old favorites. So if you don't know it, it's really easy. It's a a song we'll repeat over and over again, and it's How I Love Jesus. And you all are so loved. If you forget everything else, remember, you are loved. Before before you were even born, you were knit together in your mommy's womb, and, and God was right there with you. And so before you even knew you were loved, you were loved, period. So we're going to sing a song, and as we sing, there's um, some motions for how, oh, how I love Jesus. So you can make a big O oh with your hands. Oh, how I love, and then the sign for Jesus, Jesus. Oh, how I, I love Jesus. All right, I love the big hand motions. And then if you want to, you can also grab an instrument. I have some wooden spoons. You can play along with James or harmonica or a drum, whatever you have, go grab it. Let's make a joyful noise and have some fun worshiping together this morning. And James, would you lead us? Thanks, Jessica. So if you are playing along, it's in E flat. If you don't have that key harmonica, do it anyway. Thank you, James, and uh, little kiddos, big kiddos at heart. Thank you so much for participating in worship in that way, for uh, joining and using your bodies, your your vocal cords, your hearts, your minds, everything that you have to worship God. We're uh, thankful that we have this opportunity to sing of the love of God because we have been loved so much. Now we're going to... Uh, share signs of fellowship and peace with one another. If we were meeting in person at Creekside Elementary School, we'd dismiss the kiddos of their classrooms, and then we would uh, shake hands or hugs or greet one another in other ways. And uh, then we'd uh, discuss and fellowship and share these signs of peace. And so instead, we use the breakout rooms over Zoom. And so you'll automatically be put into a breakout room and, and sent out. And then and what we'll do is we'll unmute you before you go so that you can share during this time. And we just ask that you introduce yourself so that other folks know your name, just in case there's somebody new, or maybe you don't know them, or maybe they don't know you. 
And then also we have a prompt each week so that you can um, pass through that awkwardness a little bit and uh, join in the, the goodness of fellowship. So this week, uh, the question, the prompt is, what is your favorite game? Now that's pretty wide open. There can be, there are lots of games. It could be a sports game. Uh, yesterday we played Uno, Old Maid, Scrabble, and one other that I can't remember. Oh, uh, Pictionary. Um, and so there, but it could be basketball, it could be football, it could be a video game. You could say, I don't like any games. I despise all games. Great. Go for it. Uh, whatever it is that you are feeling this morning, feel free to share it. So introduce yourselves and then we'll, um, and then you can use that prompt to share signs of fellowship with one another. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute everybody right now. So get ready. Thank you so much for uh, sharing in those signs of fellowship and getting to know one another deeper and um, peace, even the peace that we've been given through God that we uh, we come together as brothers and sisters and share that. Um, uh, as Lee's getting ready to lead us, I'll just share one of our favorite games right now too is headbands, which is where you put the thing. Yep. All right. And it's like an animal or something like that. I'm terrible at it and my family gathers much joy from my inability to know that I have a squirrel or a bathtub or whatever item is up there. So uh, if you haven't played that with some folks, you should do that. Uh, that one seems like that could work over Zoom, by the way, too. All right, uh, Lee, will you lead us now as we continue this worship uh, as the gathered people of God in song? Yes, let's sing together.
is the good news that God is for us. Well, if you were with us last week, you know that we talked about uh, resurrection and uh, not just as in the dead coming back to life, but the dead parts of our lives coming back to life and the newness of life that God offers. And Susie Bird shared her resurrection story, which was so good. And it's up on YouTube if you want to see it, um, because it was a, a fantastic little picture of resurrection, of mini resurrection, which can be a sign of life and hope and encouragement. And so we're going to have one of these each and every week. We've got a few lined out, but if you have a resurrection story that you'd love to share, we would love for you to share it to spread some of the good news. And so this morning, we're going to hear from Peyton Crump, and Peyton's going to share a little bit of his resurrection story this morning. Hey, everybody. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, from the time I was uh, very young until the time I left for college, um, I was brought up on a form of Christianity that uh, first and foremost instilled um, kind of like three main things. And, and the first was that only a very small group of people uh, were gonna make it to heaven. Uh, the second part of that was we uh, were among that small group because we believe the right things. And then thirdly, uh, only those that believe our way uh, are in this group. Um, and so, you know, I'm sure your question is, <laughs> well, what was believing your way? Um, and the reality was it was a huge iceberg of rules. Um, but uh, at the tip of that iceberg, um, at least for me as a kid, uh, there was kind of like uh, the getting saved rules and the staying saved rules. And the getting saved was basically uh, hear the word, which was uh, the King James version, had to be the King James version. Uh, believe that word, repent of your sins, confess that Jesus is Lord and be baptized. So you've probably heard that before. Hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized. And then what I was hearing as a child was there were also five and many more staying saved, but the, the ones that kind of like uh, just resonated, uh, it felt like were go to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, communion must be taken every week. Instruments and clapping are wrong when you're worshiping. Um, don't get divorced, don't drink, and don't curse. And if you're a woman, submit to your husband. The rules went on and on. Uh, but then at the end of the big rules list was basically this idea that uh, the main rule, don't go to any church that doesn't follow these rules. Um, because uh, everything was black and white. The rules were black and white. And God was simply watching you to see if you followed the rules. Um, and if you weren't, it, you know, if you weren't following the rules, well, then hell was waiting for you. Um, also, during those 18 years at home, uh, had at home, I had loving but constantly fighting parents, uh, an angry, aggressive, and sometimes abusive dad, and then a mom who would not leave that situation because of the whole divorce rule and um, because she couldn't support herself. So, uh, you know, at the age of 18, um, basically, where was I with all of this? Uh, I was scared. I was confused, um, quite angry on the inside, and uh, very judgmental. I mean, you know, when you're, when you're brought up being told you're in a group that is right and everybody else is wrong, there's a lot of uh, judgment baked into that. Um, so that was kind of, all of that was kind of God, Jesus, church, and Christianity in a nutshell for me. Um, so then I went off to college, uh, tried to find another one of these churches that kind of fit the bill that seemingly had the same beliefs. But soon I was in this church and I, 
I found that it was a bit different, that this church was okay with questioning. Um, in other words, there were some things, it was okay to explore the idea of potential gray areas and that everything wasn't black and white. Um, and I think it all, uh, you know, in the years that I was in this church, there were a lot of uh, resurrection moments, aha moments, but um, this one really kind of always stands out to me in, in my head. And it was that a couple of leaders in the church um, were going to lead a class on the Pharisees in the Bible. Um, and if you don't happen to know uh, who the Pharisees were, they were members of a party that were experts in rules and laws and legalism. And they created laws upon laws upon laws for life and holiness, hundreds and hundreds of laws. Um, and then they dishonestly touted themselves as keepers of all of these laws while also making it impossible for anyone to keep them all. Um, ultimately, they were Jesus's enemies. Um, he called them hypocrites uh, and telling them that they shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. And, you know, I, I didn't really know why we would spend uh, weeks on weeks in a class about the Pharisees. I mean, I knew the Pharisees. I knew that Jesus disliked them. I disliked them. End of story. But it turns out I get into this class and uh, was kind of um, uh, rudely introduced to the, to the premise of the class, which was that we just might be modern day Pharisees, um, that we might be more concerned about rules than about love, and that we uh, might be more concerned about who was outside of the saved circle uh, than anything. And, <laughs> you know, as a college student, this kind of just kind of blew my mind. Um, but the cool thing was, is it um, started me on a really important path toward re-exploring God and my faith. And, and over time, uh, you know, my rule book changed. Um, and, you know, the, uh, this was huge. This was huge. I mean, it, it is, it's changed my life, uh, my faith. Uh, for the better. So now um, <laughs> my iceberg of rules is much smaller. Um, and at the top, I place uh, five new rules um, for my faith. And rule one is that God is love and therefore love is God. Uh, rule two is that love is patient, kind, Prideless, selfless, honoring of others, unconditional, protective, hopeful, and persevering. And then rule three is that if love is those things and God is those things, then when I show those things, I show God. And then rule number four is when someone experiences those things that are love and that are God, they experience God. And then rule five is love never fails and God never fails. And so, uh, you know, it's probably clear, but um, this resurrection story for me leaves me in a, a much better place than anger and judgment and guilt. Uh, instead, I experience much more freedom and love and hope. Um, and, you know, if you've been here at the gathering for any amount of time, uh, you know that our mission is to love people incredibly well as Jesus did. So, uh, man, I, you know, I just couldn't be at a better place and, and thank God, uh, any more than I can for, for the gathering church and, uh, and for this journey that I've been on. Uh, thanks, Kurt. Yeah, thank you, Peyton, for sharing, and uh, praise God for uh, not giving up on you, right? Not failing you and bringing you along in this and others and bringing us along with you in this journey, and thanks for sharing. Um, it, it gives us great encouragement to hear from one another, I think, and 
not to assume that the professional religious class uh, who went to school for this, like myself, have all the answers and have it all perfectly laid out, but that, in fact, wisdom comes from uh, all of us and that we're seeking to follow faithfully together. So thank you, Peyton. Sarah, will you read our scripture passage for today so that we can see some about this powerful love of God that crosses these boundaries and draws us in and challenges our our notions about how the world works. Luke seven thirty six through 50. One of the Pharisees invited Jesus to eat with him. After he entered the Pharisee's home, he took his place at the table. Meanwhile, a woman from the city, a sinner, discovered that Jesus was dining in the Pharisee's house. She brought perfumed oil in a vase made of alabaster. Standing behind him, at his feet, and crying, she began to wet his feet with her tears. She wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured the oil on them. When the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw what was happening, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. He would know that she is a sinner. Jesus replied, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, speak, he said. A certain lender had two debtors. One owed enough money to pay 500 people for a day's work. The other owed enough money for 50. When they couldn't pay, the lender forgave the debts of them both. Which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the largest debt canceled. Jesus said, you have judged correctly. Jesus turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? When I entered your home, you didn't give me water for my feet, but she wet my feet with tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but she hasn't stopped kissing my feet since I came in. You didn't anoint my head with oil, but she has poured perfumed oil on my feet. This is why I tell you that her many sins have been forgiven, so she has shown great love. The one who is forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other table guests began to say among themselves, who is this person that even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Amen. Let us pray. God, we thank you for your powerful forgiveness. Thank you that your love shows up in our lives and pours out of us because you have forgiven us and loved us well. So speak to us now this morning. Continue speaking to us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I see dead people. With those words, Haley Joel Osment's character scared the living daylights out of me when I watched the movie The Sixth Sense by M. Night Shyamalan. Now, you don't need to have seen the movie to know anything about it, except that um, in addition to scaring me, this movie fascinated me because the little boy named Cole, he had a different vision of the world. He could see people in a way that others couldn't. And he noticed things that others missed, which revealed these important aspects of characters about who they were and, and their desires in life. Now, this is not a sermon about ghosts or endorsing some theology of the movie, but we're going to talk about vision, Jesus's vision in particular, but also ours and how we see people, how we're called to see people and how Jesus sees us. Um, in today's passage, which Peyton actually set up perfectly with his discussion about this group of folks with Pharisees. Um, Jesus asks Simon, the Pharisee, do you see this woman? Do you see her? 
Jesus asks this religious one, the one who seeks to follow God, to love God. Remember, the Pharisees and their rules uh, not always were designed um, out of hypocrisy. I mean, they were trying to stay holy, trying to show that they loved God. Now, it got out of hand uh, in the ways that, that Peyton illustrated and that come up in our own lives. But they're ones who want to love God and to stay holy and pure. And to this person, Jesus says, do you see this woman? Simon, who's invited Jesus over to his house as a guest for dinner, uh, for a dinner party, a feast. And Simon can see all right. But Jesus wants to know if he can see this woman, this woman who's known about town as a sinner, who has a reputation. Do you see this woman, Simon? This woman who learned that Jesus was dining at Simon's house and interrupted this meal, breaking all sorts of religious and social conventions and laws. This woman with a reputation, but she just had to be in Jesus's presence because she'd heard about his reputation, his reputation that he was a friend of tax collectors and sinners that he hung out with people uh, that maybe religious folk weren't willing to hang out with, that in his presence, the blind received sight and the lame learned to walk, that those with diseases and sickness were healed and even the dead were raised, that he preached good news to the poor, that he wanted to lift them out of their poverty and give them freedom. And then he said, it's not just the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick, this one who even forgives sin. Man, boy, oh boy, wouldn't that be something to wipe the slate clean, to be released from the bondage of our past, to experience freedom. Do you see this woman, this woman who brought the expensive alabaster jar of perfumed oil, who wept at Jesus' feet and bathed his feet in tears, tears of repentance or sorrow or loneliness or isolation or of not being seen except by the cruel gaze of judgment from religious men like Simon. And then she dries her feet with her hair and touches his feet, even kisses his feet, the dirtiest part of his body she makes clean. And then she pours this oil, this perfumed oil, and he says, do you see this woman? But Simon doesn't really see her. He doesn't see her like Jesus sees her. He doesn't see the devotion, the welcome that she offers Jesus, the clear um, welcome that she has received from Jesus. He can't see past her sin. He's stopped. He, he just sees a, a caricature of her, sees her as her sin, as though that is what she was in totality, sees her as her reputation or, or at her worst moment. Now, he doesn't see himself that way, doesn't necessarily see anybody else at the dinner party that way. But Simon's sight is so limited by his perspective, and it affects the way he lives in the world. Charles has a, a slide for you, a picture that he's going to share by the street artist uh, named Banksy. And uh, he's based in the UK, the United Kingdom, and uh, he's an anonymous artist. His identity remains unknown, even though he's been active for about 30 years, and he's known for his disruptive vision. And uh, he's, he did this piece right here, and it's called Season's Greetings, and it appeared uh, just before Christmas in 2018. And it'll show up, these things just show up randomly in the nighttime, usually. And so it's on the wall of a garage in this place called Port Talbot in Wales. But this is only what you see with this little boy with his arms outstretched, tongue open. He's got his sled, his winter coat on, and his uh, hat. And he's um, eating or trying to capture what looks like snow. But this is only half the image. See, it's on a corner. And on the other side of this corner, and Charles has the full image so you can see it, is the rest of this piece of artwork. That's a dumpster that's on fire. And so the what we think of as snow are actually ashes coming out of this dumpster fire. So once you see the whole image, it completely changes your perspective of what's going on. And um, it's 
meant to be this vision of how um, this area uh, is home to the largest steel plant in the United Kingdom. And so this black dust, which is a byproduct, sort of covers huge swaths of this town. And it's known as one of the most polluted uh, towns in the United Kingdom. The point, though, is that how we see affects how we live in the world. Banksy's trying to draw our attention to the world we're passing on to our children and how we care for this world. The point matters, though, is that, that our perspective, our, our way that we see drastically shifts our understanding of things. So the place from where we see the world and the people in it and our neighbors and community members is of great concern to Jesus. Jesus wants us to see him and to see with him. So he says, do you see this woman? Jesus sees this woman, the forgotten, the ignored. Jesus sees us, sees past our sin, our worst mistakes, the ways we fail. We're received by Jesus and seen by him, loved, welcomed, accepted. And in turn, we can then receive and see others and see Jesus in them. Just as Jesus said in Matthew 25, whenever you give a drink to the thirsty or food to the hungry or visit those who are sick or in prison, you see me, you treat me as you treat them. Do we see people? Or do we only see our judgments of them? Do we see the people the world often forgets or ignores, the poor, those struggling with housing insecurity or addiction? And if we do see people, how do we see them? How do we see each other? And how do we see ourselves? Right? Because we don't know people. It's like, oh, there goes Mr. Liar. That's misjudgmental. Let me introduce you to my friend, Mr. Self-Important. No, we don't know Moses as the murderer. We know Moses as the deliverer, as the one who participates in God's freedom and deliverance. How do we see people? Because Simon sees this woman touching Jesus, getting her spiritual, sinful germs all over him in his mind. He thinks this thought. And Simon doesn't see how she receives Jesus and how Jesus receives her. Jesus doesn't stop her, doesn't recoil from her touch, even though she's known as a sinner. But we've seen that Jesus isn't afraid of spiritual cooties. He touches the untouchable. Remember, he touches the man with leprosy, or he's not even afraid to touch death. Last week, he, he touched the stretcher with the dead body on it. He touches these things with compassion and love, and they go out from him into the world and transform our lives. So where others see sin and death, Jesus sees the potential, the possibility of forgiveness and life. Jesus sees this woman and invites us to see with him. And Simon, poor Simon, he doesn't see the hospitality, the welcome that she offers, but Jesus sees it. Uh, in verse 44, Jesus says, when I entered your home, you didn't do all these things that you were supposed to do for me, these signs of hospitality that you're supposed to share with your guest. You neglected me. Yet this uninvited woman, the one with the reputation, she shows me true hospitality it's a shame that sometimes in our lives and in our world that quote unquote sinners act more like Jesus than Christians do. Her acts of hospitality, though, are, are lifted up. They're acts of adoration and worship. Jesus says she's the example. She's the model to follow with your life. Worship is being hospitable to Jesus. So how are we hospitable to Jesus in worship, in our hearts and in our lives are we open to receiving Jesus? I've asked Ray and Rochelle to dialogue a little bit on this passage as well so that you hear different voices and not just the voice, for instance, of another religious male telling you how to live your life. So uh, Ray and Rochelle, can you help us see with Jesus and understand what's going on here in this passage? Sure, sure. Thank you, Kurt, so much. Lent is the time for us to see ourselves rightly. Uh, earlier in the week, Jessica sent out a video link to the youth in reflection on what they were doing last year. And in it, um, the video uh, was of a guy named John Jorgensen, I believe was his name. He said, Lent is a time to reflect, repent, 
and prepare our hearts for the celebration of Easter to resolve to pursue God with greater intensity. And for our story today, we cut right in to the middle of that beautiful cyclical process that we observe now as Lent that she is experiencing in her life. She has reflected. There is a prior encounter with Jesus that has led her to this encounter of having Jesus um, be um, the object of her love and affection and humility. We're, we're past the repentance process, I think, for her and in preparation um, here of her thankfulness and her humility. What I see is her expression of gratitude in the freedom that the saving work of Jesus um, has given her. Um, we don't have sort of the, the privilege of knowing what that story was before because we're, we're where it is now. It's a little bit like those of us who were around in 1977 when the first Star Wars came out. It actually ends up being the fourth Star Wars. And so the younger folks have the benefit of a story um, that runs in chronological time where the rest of us did ha just had to take it as a moment in time. That's sort of where we are here. And as we say this, we wanna make sure that we remember that in her honesty and her reflection, that's what's moved her to repentance. It's a re realization of her shame and her guilt and a regret that very sadly, the Pharisee does not have at this snapshot in his life. The mm -hmm. longer I sat with this passage, the sadder I became for the Pharisee who is living almost a life. He's right there in the presence of Jesus and in the presence of true uh, heroic uh, gratitude um, on behalf of the woman. And he doesn't see it. Now, I want to say two just very short things about what's going on here. Her authenticity is profound. And profound authenticity is not petite. It is not genteel. It is not lovely. It is, sorry folks, I, I hope I don't get too many giggles out of this. When your head is down like that and you are weeping, you need Kleenexes to blow your nose. It is not polished. It is raw and beautiful. And we live in a culture that will request of us as Christians to be authentic and vulnerable. And we will spend as much time and money as it takes to help ourselves appear authentic. Because sadly, like the Pharisee, sometimes we want the authenticity without the vulnerability. We want to roll out of bed in the morning, making it look like we look this great, like we're automatically this smart or are automatically this athletic without the ugliness of what it takes to get to the beauty of the end result, which is sitting in freedom at Christ's feet. And then the second thing I want to say, and I want to say this especially to the young people, and that's that if you're in a position where you know your sins are forgiven and you are living in the grace of Christ, do not let anyone ever, ever, ever try to steal that grace. Now, the Pharisee didn't say it out loud, but he was just there. He could not afford her the change in her countenance. He knew her. He saw that something was different about her, and he ignored the difference. It's not just that he didn't see her. It is that he did not see the change in her. There's more he didn't see, you know, Ray. There's more he didn't see. And the, the, what I'm fascinated by with this story is that um, Jesus asks Simon, do you see this woman? And Kurt, you've made 
really good on that point that Jesus sees her, that Jesus sees us. At other times, we know that Jesus asked his followers, who do you say I am? Jesus wants to know if we see him for who he is. And Simon and the other Pharisees were not able to do that. You see, their words, well, if this man were really a prophet, he would know what kind of person that is. They question Jesus and Jesus's position and Jesus's ability to see, not realizing that Jesus does see and sees clearly. And so, of course, Jesus says, let me tell you a story. As he so often does, Jesus illustrates what's up by telling a story. And he tells them the story of a man who forgives one person a small sum of money and another person 10 times that sum of money. And he puts the question to Simon, so which one do you think loves the man more? And Simon's answer is, well, I suppose the one who's been forgiven more. But the point is not just that the woman was very sinful and was forgiven and loves more. The point is here that the one who has been forgiven more can see the value of the forgiveness. It is this woman, the one whom Simon would dismiss as the sinner. She's the one who sees Jesus for who he is. She's the one who worships. She's the one who anoints. She's the one who loves because she's the one who can see Jesus clearly. This correction of vision has to do with how we see Jesus, how we see the people around us, and how we see ourselves. And in this season of Lent, we're being invited to have our vision corrected from the top down getting to understand, first of all, that God is love, that God is good, that God is here with us, and everything else flows from that. We can believe what is true about God, and what's true about ourselves, and what is true about every other image bearer, because God sets our vision right. And who is God? He's the one here who tells the woman, your faith has saved you. Yeah, I feel like the, the beauty of, of both of those things that you all have said, that like the, the on, authenticity that's required and the vulnerability that's required is because of the power of forgiveness, that we can be there is freedom in knowing that it's okay, that we don't have to hide the broken parts of our lives. We don't have to necessarily display them to everybody all the time, right? But in the safety of community and love with one another, that we can share the brokenness that we have with, within our lives because we know that there is freedom and forgiveness on the other side of that, that Jesus willingly gives it to us. So we don't have to hold back and live in sort of the shame bubble or the hidden bubble of like, here's what's wrong with me, but nobody else has these issues. Uh, that to me is like the, the release that's allowed is that, okay, I'm not the only one. It's that moment of like, oh, you too. That's right. And I love the way Jesus sees her not as sinner, but as woman of great faith. And I think that's what one of the gifts of this passage is the acknowledgement of this woman's humanity and that what that means to Jesus that means Jesus sees her as an image bearer of God Jesus sees her as daughter we tend to label people and you you were so funny Kurt um, misjudgmental or <laughs> Mr. Self-righteous but but we do this so often and I have learned from um, my brothers and sisters of color who have said that they prefer that we not speak of masters and slaves, but instead speak of people who were held in bondage as those who were enslaved. 
And that seems cumbersome, perhaps, when it comes to semantics, but it's actually important. Those who were held in bondage, those who were enslaved, they were not defined by the fact that they were enslaved. That was one thing about them. More important was that they were image bearers of God. More important was that they were children of God. Were they enslaved? Yes, and that's a heinous thing. But to reduce them to just slavery is to see them as less than human. And we can do this with the way that we look at people. It's so easy to look at that woman and various versions of the, of the scripture might say a harlot, a whore, a prostitute. Mm, perhaps that's true, but that's not how Jesus sees her. He sees her as beloved. Yeah, that is so true. Uh, and we learn from our friends at Jubilee Home, for instance, I have anyway, um, from Dave and Pip and others there, as we heard from them um, a month or so ago, right? We don't refer to folks who've been imprisoned as convicts. They're not identified by the fact that they are imprisoned. They're people who are imprisoned or have been imprisoned. Um, and, and that feels like uh, an important distinction to know where our identity lies. It is <laughs> not in these, it's in Christ. It's in who we've been made to be as image bearers and as reflectors of divine love. Um, yep. The good news too is that this table that Jesus eats at um, is a bit different than his table. At his table, where he is the host, everybody's invited, everybody is welcome. He welcomes all and he shows us all hospitality. He is the ultimate host. The kingdom of heaven is like a great banquet or a feast, Jesus often says, where all are welcome. And he says, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. You can go in peace. And we embody and enact this truth. We remember this each week with the Lord's Supper, with the Eucharist, with this time of communion when we share bread and cup. And so I'd invite you, if you have these elements with you, to get them now to share in this meal with us. Because on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he blessed it, gave thanks for it, and he broke it. And then he gave it to them, to his disciples, his friends, and even the one who would betray him. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Join me in prayer. God, we, we confess that our love falls short. And we get caught in these cycles of, of brokenness, that we perpetuate sin and Lord, we lean into your forgiveness, that we've been forgiven much, and so therefore we're free to love much. God, we thank you for this bread and this cup, for the gift of your life that you share with us. Lord, we need you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, whether you are in a room by yourself or with a whole bunch of people in your family, we know that this meal is offered up to us all freely. And this meal is sacred because God is present with us at this table. And so we invite you to partake in this meal. This is the body of Christ, which is given for you. And this is the blood of Christ, which is poured out for you. Taste and see that the Lord is good.
Jesus, what a beautiful name. Son of God, Son of Man, Lamb that was slain. Joy and peace, strength and hope, grace that blows our fear away. What a beautiful name Jesus What a beautiful name Truth revealed My future sealed Healed my pain Love and freedom Life and war that blows our fear away Jesus what a beautiful name Jesus what a beautiful name rescued my soul my stronghold lifts me from shame Forgiveness, security, power and love Grace that blows our fear away Jesus, what a beautiful name Forgiveness, security, power and love Grace that blows our fear What a beautiful name Jesus What a beautiful name Jesus What a beautiful name Amen Amen. Thank you, Lee, for that reminder of the beautiful name of Jesus and the power it has in our lives to give us freedom and forgiveness and love, which enables us to be generous and loving in our communities, in our neighborhoods, and our places of work. Uh, each week we talk about generosity at this moment after we have received from God as a way of giving thanks uh, we do that collectively. We say thank you to you for your generosity, for the ways that you have given uh, to the ministry of the Gathering Church. Uh, what we do is not possible without you. So thank you for being generous. Um, if you'd like to give to partner with us in our uh, mission of loving others incredibly well, you can do that a couple different ways. You can um, give online. I'll put the link in the chat and you can also mail in a check. Um, a number of things happen because of your generosity. It's things like uh, Jessica taking care of our children and youth and our Lenten lunch break led by Ray and our partnerships in our community. And one important one of those, uh, a way that we're serving and loving during this time of COVID is our COVID-19 Benevolence Fund. Um, thank you. We continue to give out um, gifts to folks, benevolent gifts to people who need support during this time. Um, we just recently gave out another gift uh, this past week. So uh, continuing to uh, help lights uh, be on, electricity be on in someone's house. So honestly, we, we can't say thank you enough for helping us love our neighbors in these tangible ways because we know that God cares about our bodies and how we love one another in this time. Um, you can join us on Tuesday night for Bible study. We dig a lot deeper into these passages, ask a whole lot of questions. Uh, as Peyton kind of mentioned in his story, we're all right with asking good questions about what's going on in this passage and why is Jesus doing this or that and how do we understand this? So we'd invite you to join us for that. Um, also on Wednesdays, as I mentioned, we have our Lenten lunch break during the day. Uh, it starts at 1230. It's via Zoom. Uh, as a way of checking in with one another and making sure that um, uh, we're doing all right, that uh, we tie together our sort of our spiritual health with our mental and emotional health. And uh, it's really short, 15, 20 minutes. 
So we'd invite you to join us in that um, during the week. And then uh, also Jessica has one announcement for us today. So Jessica, what do you have? Yeah, thanks. So just to just a heads up, youth group, we are going to meet in person. If you would like for a check in in person at Old Chapel Hill Road, we were kind of iffy with the weather, but it looks like it's going to clear. So we're going for it. So stop by, say hi, two to three, Old Chapel, Old Chapel Hill Road Park. <laughs> thanks, Jessica. Uh, it's good. It's good to see people and be seen and a reminder, right? Wear your mask. We're staying distant. For those of you who aren't youth, don't worry. They're being smart and safe, as are we all. We encourage you to continue to do that in your various places. Lee is now going to lead us in singing the doxology as we sing our faith and our praise of God as we go forth. for the harmonica and I cannot wait to hear Dan Hall and others on the drums when we return in person for our doxology. If you have never heard that, it is a gift. Friends, as we uh, depart from this time together, may you know that your faith, that the love and forgiveness of God have saved you, have made you whole, and you can go in peace. Grace and peace Friends, we love you. We miss you. We're praying for you. We're holding you up. If you want to stick around in this Zoom room, we uh, unmute now and sort of uh, let the chaos happen as it will. And so if you'd like to stick around and join in in that, you can. I'm going to ask everybody to unmute now. And here we go.